Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Welcome. To, glad you're here. Those online as well, welcome to our service. If you're a first-time visitor, we'd love to know that. If you could fill out a green card, and if you do, and give it to one of our welcome team members, we would love um, to give you a, a small gift of appreciation for joining us this morning. So a variety of, mess, uh, a variety of uh, announcements. First, uh, it's, you will see in the bulletin that it's scheduled that we're to have our prayer after our, the service. Uh, we didn't do a good job of reviewing that, so it should, it should be next week. So that's my bad and Eric's bad. Um, we should, um, it'll be next Sunday after church for prayer. So I'm through you under the bucks, Eric, as well. <laughs> Where are you, Eric? There you are. <laughs> Um, so next week is our prayer time. Thinking about prayer, though, in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, November 7, 19th to 20th, we're having our 12-hour prayer vigil. And so we're tying that into our preparation for Advent. So we would love, it's, you know, it's from 7 p.m. on Saturday to 7 a.m. on Sunday. And we would like to, for each of those periods, to be filled in. So you can uh, go to the bulletin, do the QR, QR code, and um, sign up for that. So again, it's a time for us as, as a church to pray together, to seek the Lord together. We'll be praying through the Psalms. It'll be a special time of, of drawing near to God, but also drawing near to one another. So mark your calendar for November 19th through 20th. Also, we are next Saturday having a uh, church-wide workday. We call it trustee day, but it's really the church. It's not just the trustees. We want everybody to participate to make our, our, um, our church and our facility and our outside beautiful. And if you notice, um, some of the hedges were chopped off, and now people can see us a lot better. So we want to thank all those who have helped with that as well. And then the one is that, you know, what's, what's coming up is Christmas as well. And so we're going to be having, we're going to be decorating the 20th after the service uh, for Christmas. So see Jerry Davis if you're interested in helping or just show up. Um, I think Will is also involved in that. So again, um, make sure if you want to participate in making our church look like uh, during the holidays, please do that. And then the last thing is, Advent devotional. Uh, we have a, a download, so if you're interested, see Jonathan or Craig Wilson on that. So um, we're trying to do a devotional. Um, um, uh, what am I? Am I drawing a blank? Advent devotional, right? I'm like <laughs> my mind. <laughs> yes, we want to do it in a small group setting. So if you're interested in doing that in your small group, or if you want to create a new small group, or if you want to, I know the deacons are trying to do it within their flock. I know that Lena and I are hoping to do it with our, the flock that we are assigned, and so it's a great way just for us to, again, draw near together and have a good time of fellowship. With that in mind, Connie, if you want to lead us. Oh, you were going to talk about Operation Christmas Child? Yes. yes. I'll be very I thought you were supposed to do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Changed our minds. <laughs> Just wanted you to all know that yesterday we packed the boxes for those of you that donated items, and we packed 101 boxes, which is the most, as far as I know, since I've been back, that we have packed. So that was wonderful, and that does not include the boxes that some of you donated individually. So it's really great news. Um, we do still have empty boxes out in the back. If you still wanted to do one, you could do it in the next week. You would have to have it in by next Sunday. Next Sunday, they all disappear and are shipped out, just so you know. And um, also, we still need, if you don't want to pack a box, but you still feel like you should support us, support Operation Christmas Child, um, we still need some money for shipping. We have to come up with $1,010 because it's $10 a box. So if you can come up with some of that money, you can write a check, put it in the, in the um, offering, you can put, give it to the office, uh, you can give it to me after worship. Okay, thank you very much. Just a reminder, um, Compassion, also we're looking for uh, 19 children to be sponsored, so if you have a heart to do that, um, there's a table in the Welcome Center to sign up for that. Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Connie Barnes, one of the elders here. I'd like to welcome our folks online also. And if possible, those of you online, if you could stand when we are standing in the congregation and sing when we're singing, 
we would really appreciate it. It would help you join into the service that much more. Would everyone please rise for the call to worship. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. We come to praise the Lord. Please remain standing for our first hymn, Come Thou Every Font. Gracious God, we come this morning to praise you, to thank you, to honor you for all that you have done in and through your word and through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can come and, and, and be your children and we can express our gratitude and our love for you as, as we experience the love that you have for us ultimately seen in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you're preparing us for glory, that here on earth you are making us more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. And so we're thankful that even together this morning as we come as a corporate body to worship you, you're doing that work of grace, that work of drawing us close to you and to one another. Lord, make that happen as we worship you today, we pray in Christ's name, amen.
and help us to truly repent and turn and follow you in every way. We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please hear our assurance of pardon. Hear the good news. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise for our confession of faith. Our confession of faith this morning is from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the everlasting life. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm Michelle Kelly, an elder at Nielsville, and I was on staff here for a long time. And part of what I've done in the years I've been at Nielsville is be a member of the worship team for a long time, so I was asked to talk about worship and stewardship. In worship committee devotions, we often have talked about what exactly is worship. And I have four short definitions just to get us started thinking about it today. Worship is everything we think, everything we say, and everything we do. And it reveals that which we treasure and value most in our lives. Two, human beings are hardwired for worship. It's inevitable that we will wor worship someone or something the God of scripture or a God of our own devising. Three, worshiping God is what we were created for. This is the final end of all our existence, the worship of God. God created the universe to display the worth of his glory and he created us so we could see this glory and reflect it by knowing and loving it with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. And four, Worship, in one sense, is the whole point of everything, the goal of our whole Christian story. It's not one segment of the Christian life among others. Worship is the entire Christian life. Our time of worship on Sunday mornings is not merely a preliminary to something else. Rather, it's the whole point of our existence as the body of Christ. But until I began gathering information for this minute for mission, I had not thought of a direct connection between worship and stewardship, except, of course, for obvious things. We paid the salaries for our dedicated and gifted preacher, musicians, and office staff. Our sanctuary and buildings have maintenance costs. They're costs for bulletins and candles and prayer cards and Bibles and banners and communion supplies and so on. But as I prepared the message, I found a very thought-provoking point. Stewardship is an act of worship, both personally and corporately, because God owns it all, and as we've heard before, we are not our own. How we manage what God has entrusted to our care speaks volumes about the condition of our hearts. Our worship services are intended to connect our hearts to the heart of God. And in a coincidence planned by the Holy Spirit, what is Pastor Jeff preaching about today? Don't let your hearts be hardened. We can't let stewardship be the last thing on our minds, but rather something we can't wait to do, eagerly giving back to God a small portion of what he has so richly blessed us with. Remember, Jesus himself said that giving reflects our heart condition, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let's explore a little bit of what I discovered about how stewardship and worship relate. If you remember, in the Old Testament, the most basic act of worship was presenting an offering to be sacrificed to God on the altar. It was about what people gave to God, 
not what God gave to people. Every Old Testament act of worship, personal or corporate, was Godward, not manward. The nature of worship didn't change in the New Testament. But sadly, in some churches today, the focus of worship has shifted. The service is rated by how much we get out of it. Some have forgotten that worship is more about what we offer God than what we receive from God. It's about giving, not receiving. Stewardship, giving, is worship. We're very familiar with stewardship as time, talents, and treasure, but it's more than about how we spend our money, manage our schedules, and use our gifts. It's a total life posture. All of life is a sacred trust for which we must give an account to God. Our focus should be on God's radical generosity. Paul writes that we're to put our hope not in wealth, but in the God who has richly given us all things to enjoy. And he wrote to the Corinthians, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Stewardship is about much more than financial offerings. We know it involves every facet of life. Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This view of worship involves more than a Sunday service. It calls for devotion to the Lord on a day-to-day -day basis. It's life worship, not just lip worship. So, how do we worship God with our lives? Here's a, a list of seven things that we're supposed to be stewarding as worship. Time. Time is life. Time passes fast. So make the most of every opportunity. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was never in a hurry, but he always had time to do God's will? Relationships. They're a gift from God. Personal relationships and those in our church family. Some are hard and messy. We're responsible for our own role in the relationship. To be a faithful steward, we focus on our own character and the other person's needs, not vice versa. Finances. Most of us think that our problems would be solved if we just had more money. The critical issue is rarely how much we have, but what we do with what we do have. We worship God by being faithful with the money he entrusted to us. Our session is always working hard at doing this. Our bodies. Paul asked the Corinthians, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with the price. So glorify God in your body. In this scripture and in Romans above, um, where it said our bodies were to be a living sacrifice, we are reminded that our bodies are given to us to do God's work and not to use in any way we wish. Our bodies are one means through which we participate in the sacraments, being washed in the water of baptism and eating and drinking the elements of the Lord's Supper. We serve with our bodies sacrificially, our spirits affect our bodies, and our bodies affect our spirits. Our bodies are holy because the Holy Spirit dwells in them. Our speech. Words are powerful. They're like nitroglycerin. They can either blow up bridges or heal your heart. God is listening to the words we say. Our words are either offerings of worship or tools of the enemy. We need to think. How does my daily speech reflect the God I serve? And our gifts. Every Christian has received at least one spiritual gift, and we're accountable to God for the proper use of it. Paul instru Peter instructs, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. With our gifts, we minister to one another in our church family. And finally, the stewardship of our witness, leading others to Christ. Christ has called all of us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Our worship and our witness go together. Live, serve, and witness in unwavering faithfulness to hear the Master say, well done, good and faithful servant, at the end of our days. These stewardship reminders are for how we live away from one another and also for church family living. This is how we worship. This is how we encourage one another and build one another up. Our corporate worship gathering on Sunday morning is a crucial place for learning all we need to be good life stewards, to worship God in every aspect of our living. When we hear God's word throughout the service, as we do every week, 
in the liturgy, in the songs, in the sermon, we're learning an attitude of submission to Scripture. When prayers are offered throughout the service, as they are every week, we're reminded that we're a people of prayer. When we pay close attention to the sermon, we're esteeming the value of preaching as vital to our personal and corporate life and health. Considering all these things, may we, with hearts overflowing with love, pledge to honor God with our living and our giving. You can make a financial pledge with an online form in the e-letter or use the QR code in the bulletin, or you can find paper copies of the pledge card in the narthex, which you can put in the offering plate. Now we are at the wonderful time in our worship when we're privileged to be able to express our gratitude, giving financially what we have joyfully set apart for the work of the gospel. The scripture from Matthew is a tad ahead of the season, but consider the magi, magi, the wise men, who traveled a very long distance to offer worship to Jesus. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Their worship was full of awe and wonder. Their gifts were extremely valuable. They offered their very best to the Christ child. May we, who know the whole story of salvation, do the same. And would the ushers please come forward now.
let us pray. Father, we do praise you and thank you for all the gifts that you have given us. From the most amazing gift of all, your Son, as our Lord and Savior. Father, we praise you for the grace that is seemingly renewed morning by morning. And we just ask that you'd help us to be more appreciative and more thankful. Father, we ask that you would bless these gifts that we've returned to you, that they would be useful in your kingdom and directed as where you want them to go. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May be seated. Now is the time in the service when the young'uns get to go worship and play after we've finished the blessing. If you're from the ages of, what is it, three through the second grade, uh, you can, are dismissed to the worship and play zone when our lovely worship leader starts, Jesus loves me. But let us pray first. Father, we just praise you and thank you for these, your children. Your children that you've given us as one of your many graces. Father, we just ask that you would help us to teach them and lead them into a greater knowledge of you, a greater love of you, that their hearts would be turned to you at an early age. And we just ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And good morning. I do want to share some sober news. Um, we wanted to pray for the Veltais family. Bob Veltais, a longtime member and elder of this church and has served in many different ways, went to be with the Lord this morning. So if you could um, pray for Betty um, in this time and their family would be greatly appreciated. I'll do that in, um, in my prayer time before um, the sermon. But um, just want to let you know that. Um, he is with the Lord, and so uh, as I spoke with uh, Betty this morning, she, he's at peace, she reminded us, and, but she would appreciate prayer for comfort and grace and just encouragement during this time. So if you know her, please reach out, send her a card, give her a call. I think they're fine for meals at this point, but um, other than that, I'm sure some source of encouragement would be good for her um, during this time. Michelle, uh, Kelly, you did a great job sharing about stewardship and worship. Um, sent, sent me also an article from Christianity Today, Fall Pastors Issue, and it had an ad for a new book, Big Trouble Ahead, um, by Alan Jackson. And it has this very provocative lead in. It says this, the challenges before us are not the result of the depravity of the wicked, but the in indifference of the faithful. The challenge is the indifference of the faithful. Um, Edward Burke, also similar, says this, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing. What I uh, am amazed by the book, uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Screwtape Letters, he gets to that point as well as, as um, Screwtape is um, just kind of trying to, to lull Christians to sleep he says this in the book, he says, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it while really it is finding its place in him. All of those statements and thoughts get to the heart of what 
this pastor to the church of Hebrews is getting at, a heart that is tempted to get hardened in our belief. So let's turn our attention to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your father puts me, put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is written, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were, for who were, for who were those who hard heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So see that they were made unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, as we gather around your word this morning, we do pray that you would speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, you want your word to speak to us today. And so, Lord, we ask for that. I pray specifically for Betty this morning as she just mourns the loss of her beloved husband. Uh, Lord, we just pray for mercy and grace and comfort to be upon her and her family and, and Bob's family. We pray, God, for, um, for us as a church to come alongside her and care for her and, and nurture her and strengthen, be a source of strength for her that, that we would point her to Jesus. Lord, we do thank you for the legacy of Bob and just the blessing he has, has been to many of us here in this church. And so, Lord, just continue to be with them. And now, Father, again, direct our attention now as we hear your word um, through this Hebrew writer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you know I became a Christian in college. And so when I became a Christian, the newness of faith was exciting. It was, I was eager to grow. I was involved in Christian fellowship. I joined a small group. I was involved eventually in the exec leadership. And so um, for me in college, it was a very uh, a growing experience, a maturing experience for me in Christ. But I noticed something also, that those other people who became, came to Ivy, who, who confessed Christ, and yet the more and more they experienced the, Christ, the college life, they began to waver in their faith. And I began to wonder why, you know, as a new Christian, why were some of these who were actually raised as Christian, those who were, um, it seemed like they had fervor when they first came to the college, and yet they began to waver in their faith. And so I began to wonder, you know, they began well in their faith, yet they, they seemed to be wrestling with the truth of Scripture. They seemed to be doubting the God of the Bible. And so for a young Christian like me, that was somewhat confusing and at times discouraging. Their hearts seemed to be hardened to Jesus. And so I asked myself, will that happen to me? Uh, what will prevent me from hardening my heart? Well, the pastor of Hebrews in this passage is addressing something very similar. The Hebrew Christians started well, but they were, seemed to be wavering. They seemed to be wanting to go back to their old-time religion. And so here the pastor warns them to stand firm by referring to Psalm 55, highlighting the Exodus story of the Israelites, when they started out well, but then they quickly wavered from their hearts, and they grew hardened. So this morning, this pastor teaches us much about what it looks like to have a heart that is hardened. And so I will focus on the following, the three R's. A hardened heart is first, it, we'll look at its roots, we'll look at its results, and then we'll look at its remedy. So let's first look at its roots, found in 7, 11, and 16 to 19. 
Let me again just read that section because I, and I think it helps us to, to get into context. And here he is quoting Psalm 55. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation, and they said, they, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I sworn in my wrath, they will not enter my rest. And then 16, those who were, for who those who heard and yet rebelled, was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned and whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So let me give you some content. Um, the pastor here is, is, is continuing to press the point of Jesus being above all things, that he is superior to all things. He wants us to continue to keep Jesus focused, keep trusting Jesus focused. So the pastor continues to maintain his focus here on the period of Moses and Joshua, like he was last week. He does this with an impassioned exhortation to this church not to repeat the mistakes of Israel in the days of Moses. He brings in Psalm 95, verses 7 and 11. The historical background is a story that follows closely the events in Numbers 12 and chapter 14 in part of the Exodus. Here, Israel refused to trust God to bring them into the promised land. After they heard the unfavorable report of the scouts, 10 out of the 12 scouts said not to enter the promised land. That land is not um, valuable for us to take. We will get harmed if we go into the land. 10 out of the 12 said that. So as a result, God swore they would, since they made the decision not go into the promised land that God had promised them, God swore that they would rather wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that adult generation who had left Egypt had died except for Caleb and Joshua, the two, two spies that said, yes, we should go and take the land. And, but um, since they didn't listen to them, right, it was overturned in the time, but soon Caleb and Joshua will, will in the end, prove to be right in their analysis. But here we go. Psalm 95, 7, 11 reflects on Israel's rebellion and on the forfeited rest in the promised land. So he exhorts this church not to make the same mistake of the former generations. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. So what is the mistake not to repeat? Well, it's unbelief. They were not believing in the promises of God, the presence of God, the power of God. They were not believing the God of the covenant, the one who entered a covenant with them. They were not believing this God who has been faithful throughout the ages. Now think about it, right? What has God done for Israel up to this point? Remember, in the book of Exodus, the people of God were in slavery. They were in bondage to the rulers of Egypt. And so God displayed his glory and his power and his presence through Moses as God delivered them from their bondage, right? Pharaoh pursued them, but the Lord God Almighty made a passage for them through the Red Sea, which then he swallowed up the Egyptian army. The people of God started out well, right? But when the people arrived in the wilderness across from the sea, they immediately began to complain. Listen to what they say. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and, and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now think about it. They just saw God save them from slavery through many miraculous acts. They had a former life of misery, and yet their response was one of ingratitude and unbelief. See, instead of trusting the Lord to supply their needs, something he has shown them and was willing to do for them, 
they complained against him. They don't believe that he will deliver. And even when the Lord graciously sent manna from heaven, right, the miraculous bread came down, rained down on them, the people continued to complain and engage in disobedience until again they confronted Moses in rebellion. Listen to what they say here. All the gener- congregation of the people of Israel moved from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandments of the Lord. The pastor here of Hebrews tells us in verse 8 that this was a time of testing. That God put them in the wilderness as a time of testing. See, God had delivered his people and now he was testing their allegiance to him with difficult travels in the wilderness. But sadly, they continued to fail the test. For instance, God was gracious when he sent Moses to strike the rock with water, with his staff, and water came out from the rock to provide for the people. Moses named that rock Masha and Meribah, meaning testing and rebellion. These are two words used in verse 8 to signify God's displeasure of his unbelieving people. I mean, there's so many examples where we're seeing in God's word and God's people how they have started out well, but they harden their hearts through unbelief. God spared them again and again. But that didn't mean that he didn't discipline them due to their unbelief. Right? He is holy. He's holy other. He's a creator, redeemer, infinite, eternal. And yet he wants to help us deal with our unbelieving hearts. In verse 11, the pastor recalls God's dreadful words as he does this. He says, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. See, the nation of Israel would enter the promised land eventually, but none of their generation would be left when it happened. Only Caleb and Joshua with their children will enter into that promised land. You see, unbelief, not believing God and his promises led to their hardened hearts. So what is this relationship between those who are very far off, right, many thousands of years ago, and the, and the people uh, of this church, and even us today, how, how, what, is there any, any relevance for us? Well, like God's people a generation ago, we were, who were delivered and cared for by God, we too have been delivered, have we not, as Christians, from the bondage to sin through the person and work of Jesus Christ. God is actively caring for us now in our faith journey. Also, like Israel of old, we are headed towards the promise land, but we're, we're headed to the heavenly promised land, where God remind, reminds us, my Hebrew pastor reminded us a couple weeks ago that he's preparing us for glory. That is our promised land. Though our journey too will be faced, our journey too will be faced with testing and trials and suffering. We are now living in the wilderness, the time of difficulty, the time filled with suffering and pain. We're not living in the promised land. No, this country is not the promised land. Amen? The promised land is the new heavens and the new earth when Christ comes again and establishes it. You see, the sooner we realize that we're living now in the wilderness, the better. Why do I say that? Because it helps us answer the questions like, why does God allow things to go wrong in my life? Why are things so hard? Why do they have to be so difficult? See, the answer is that today is a day of testing, and tomorrow is a day of testing, and Wednesday is a day of testing, and Friday is a day of testing, but the day of rest is yet to come. And I often say, come, Lord Jesus. (laughs) A.W. Pink here challenges us here on this testing. Listen to what he says. "Testing Testing reveals the state of our heart. A crisis neither makes nor mars a man, but it does manifest him. While all is smooth sailing, we appear to be getting nicely along. But are we, he says. Our minds, are, 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 are our minds stayed upon the Lord, or are we instead complacently resting in his temporal, temporal mercies? When the storm breaks, is it, is, it, is it not so much that we fail under it as that our habitual lack of leaning upon God, of daily walking in dependence upon, 
is more evident. See, when the storm breaks, is it not so much that we fail under it as much as our habitual lack of leaning upon God, of daily walking in dependence upon God? See, the testing, the many testings of my faith, of the, of the struggle with infertility, the loss of our son Scott, the, the being a pastor in church planning, parenting, were times used to further my dependence upon God, upon Christ. It's in those times that he strengthened my faith. In these challenging times, did I, did I wrestle with God? Did I ask him questions, right? Did I, I doubt sometimes what he was doing? Absolutely. Yet what kept me on the right track of that testing is being more and more captivated by Jesus and all that he is and all that he has done for me. We will go through testing. May that not give you an unbelieving heart. May it may help you run more and more to Christ who will help you in those times of testing. So what are the results of this unbelieving heart? Look at verses 16 and 19. It says, for, those who, for, for who those who were heard, who heard and yet rebelled, was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those with whom he sinned, who sinned whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So what are some results of an unbelieving heart? We're first in verse 16, rebellion and disobedience. See, a heart that falls from believing in God's presence and God's promise and God's power, that he's our redeemer and creator, will live a life of, of disobedience and rebellion. We will just not care anymore. Like the Israelites, we will rise up against God and his spokesman and boldly state, is God among us or not? Doubting God's presence and promises and power. This rebellion then is mixed with the following characteristics. First of all, contempt and irreverence. The death of God's people, unbelief, produced contempt contempt and irreverence. We see this displayed among God's people in their decision not to enter the promised land. Their hearts hardened, led them to, to be irreverent towards God's promises. Remember, when the 12 spies returned from the 40-day mission, they had conflicting recommendations. 10 out of 12 said the land was untakeable, while only Caleb and Joshua said it was takeable. See, the Israelites even hardened their hearts because they were going to stone Caleb and Joshua for even giving their report. Listen to how God responds to their contempt. He says this, But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? Here is people of God who've seen miracles after miracles. They've seen God deliver them again and again and again. God sensing that the people of God has despised him. How long will they not believe in me in spite of of all the signs I have done among them. Again, God indicted the hearts of Israel, indicted the hearts of God's people during that time. They were unbelieving, they were refusing to believe, their hearts were full of contempt. They had mutually attested, right, miracles of the Passover and the Exodus. No one could dispute the reality of those amazing God events. They had daily provision of the cloud by night, right? And the fire, or the cloud by day and the fire by night. They were daily fed with manna and quail, but they actively refused God for the land, to believe God for the land. See, their unbelief mounted to contempt for God, a irreverence to the holy, faithful character of God. That contempt then led to negativism. They were never grateful for God's ongoing work but was always negative about their situation. Couldn't God do this instead? Why why does it have to be so hard? God doesn't care about us. His ways seem inconvenient, unfair, out of date. Any of you guys wrestle with that? And that negativity then leads to grumbling. Well, it's interesting. um, uh, Moses records in Numbers uh, at least four times how Israel complained and grumbled to God. Listen to what he says. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. 
How long shall this wicked generation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. And when the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregations grumble against me by bringing up a bad report about the land. You see, when our faith fades, when we begin to doubt the goodness and mercy and the grace of God and his promises and presence ultimately experienced in Christ, it spawns grumbling and complaining. How is your grumbling and complaining? How is mine? What's interesting, we also see that a characteristic of an unbelieving heart is quarreling. During that time, God's people were arguing with one another. They were not at peace with one another. They, their fighting caused a divided people, an unsettled people, an agitated people. See, when the gospel, when Christ is not ultimate in our life, if he's not the most supreme in our life, if he's not the centerpiece of our life, it often leads to fighting among one another over even little things. We see it, right? We see it in, today in, the universe, uh, uh, in P- Facebook, Twitter, Christians saying horrible things to one another. And I wonder, okay, hey God, what has gone on here? Why, what are we missing? Why, why isn't Christ more centered in our discussions with one another? It must be. See, the hardness of heart is rooted in unbelief, which produces contempt for God, which in, so, then turns out that shows itself in negativism, grumbling, complaining, disobedience, and rebellion. See, if I had a mirror here, we owe it, right, to ourselves to, to hold up a mirror of God's word into our hearts, right, to see where, so that we can accurately get an accurate reading of our spiritual pulse. What does our behavior indicate? A hardening, unbelieving heart or the joyful, hopeful tenderness of a faithful and rested heart in the gospel? The pastor reminds us of the Holy Spirit's work in helping us to look into that mirror. In fact, this author so is convinced that the, um, the psalm is a part of God's word. He says the Holy Spirit is speaking, right? He, he's showing that there's authority of Scripture as he brings the Holy Spirit to work here. And so he brings about Psalm 55 to exhort us to stand firm. And so we see then in verses 12 and 15 the remedy to our, to our wrestling with our unbelief. Look to what it says. It says, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil and unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is written today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. The first remedy that we see is in verse 12. It says what? Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. What is he saying? We must first actively look at our own heart and evaluate where we are with the Lord. How are we holding that mirror to our hearts? What is God exposing? Right? The pastor says some very hard things. To fall away here actually means to willingly apostatize or or willingly to, to go away from the Christian faith. Such turning, he says, such neglect of your heart always incurs a huge cost. Remember, the pastor here is reminding us that Jesus is greater than everything. He's greater than Moses. So the loss in rejecting Jesus is greater than the loss in rejecting Moses. The disobedient rebels in Moses' day missed the promised blessing of entry into the land of Cana. But rebellion against Christ today forfeits the even grander blessing of eternal life. So hear me loud and clear. I will not be loud, but hear me clear. Well, maybe I should be loud. I don't know. To turn away from the living God, as the pastor describes God, is a colossal mistake. For as a pastor later says in Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into hands of the living God. 
The pastor doesn't see this as a remote possibility for this struggling young church. He knows that there's some in that church who are wrestling and they're now dealing with a very real and present danger. He wouldn't have illustrated Psalm 95 if so. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, we must be wise and careful for our own hearts. We must actively search to see if there's any sin, evil, unbelief residing there, resting there. Tend to it, he encourages us. Seek the Holy Spirit's help in this regard. Ask him to show you, read scripture, to encourage you. Search your hearts first. That is a remedy to help us to continue to hold on to Jesus as we search our heart. But we also see a second remedy. It says to come alongside one another in verse 13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. How different, different it would have been for the Israelites if they would have encouraged one another instead of falling into negativism, grumbling, and quarreling. I need mutual encouragement. You need mutual encouragement. We need to be reminded of God's goodness and grace. We need others to help us to work on our temptation with sin. We need others to share our burden when dealing with trials, testing, and suffering. We need to be held accountable in areas we are struggling with in our lives. We cannot do this alone. Amen? We cannot do this alone. We are, encouraged to, we are encouraged to daily encourage one another, not just on Sunday, but every day. I think of uh, Bob, who just recently passed away. When I first started to, to come here and to serve here, I would notice these yellow cards all throughout the church. Right? Do you remember, you guys, a lot of you guys remember that? Those yellow different cards. They're, they, were, they were pithy statements, or they could be scripture, but his, I think his goal for us as, we, as he put these yellow cards all around was to encourage us in our faith, to, to keep the main thing the main thing, to, 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 to read his word, to know that there's power in reading his word. He reminds us to pray and to seek God first. He reminds us to share forth the gospel of Christ. He, he, he encouraged us to stand firm in our faith, not our hearts to be hard, hardened. That's a legacy I think Bob leaves this church. We need people like that to speak into our lives, and we are called to speak into the lives of others, not to ram the Bible down your throats, but to come alongside one another in a way that we can wrestle with Scripture together and grow together in Christ. That's why we want to do small groups. That's why we, this, the, the, the Advent devotional small group we want to do together so that we can help one another grow in our faith. We need to humbly say to one another, Listen to God's word. Believe it. So that, as F.F. Bruce says, you may not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness, making tomorrow's repentance and faith more difficult. Let's come alongside one another in our faith, pointing us to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Another remedy is confidence to endure. It says, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Or another way to say that, that we hold on trust with which we began. So the Israelites had confidence after the exodus, but quickly faded a few days later in the wilderness. The pastor is calling this church, our church, to have confidence in the faith that we have in Christ to endure to the end. Right? Often new converts have a few doubts, but years of living and learning often soften our confidence. Yet, Growing Christians are committed to working through our doubts, holding on to Jesus, for he is holding on to us. Like I said last week, I believe true believers will persevere. They will hold on to their original confidence firm to the end. If we do not persevere, then we have lost, just as the Apostle John explained. He says this, they went out from among us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that might, and that it might become plain that they are not of us. See, this pastor has a deep, passionate love and concern for the church in the midst of temptation and persecution, knowing for some, perseverance is not a far-gone conclusion. So he warns again, a second time in this text, today, if you hear his voice, 
Do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. Do you need to hear that today or do I need to hear that today? For the last remedy is a remedy that is beyond all remedy and that is to consider Jesus. It says, for we have come to share in Christ. See, our confidence to endure is not in our own works and our own strength, but the power for salvation that is in Jesus Christ. Our confidence is that we share in Christ. We are in Christ, right? We're in union with Christ. We are partners with, with Christ. But it assumes that we have a changed identity, that we belong to Christ, that we have the same father, we, have, we, have the, we belong to the same family. And so through Christ's incarnation, his obedient, perfect obedience, his willing and joyful sacrifice, his resurrection, his now intercession on our behalf as he sits at the right hand of God the Father, we share the blessedness and the benefits that are rightly Jesus's. It is this original confidence, namely the very message of the gospel, that saves us in the first place. That is what we need to persevere to the end. See, the gospel message is not something we just believe when we first come as a Christian. No, it's the gospel that makes us Christian. It's a gospel, that gospel that keeps us in our faith. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who came and lived and died and rose again and has ascended and now intercedes for us. That is the gospel message we need to hold on to to the very end. So as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let us consider Jesus in context to this pastor's message this morning. When we read the account of Jesus' life, we find him too sent into the wilderness, do we not? Listen to what Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 tells us. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now how significant that he went there for how many days? 40 days. How many days, how many years was Israelites in the wilderness? 40 years, yeah. The very number of year Israel was tested and yet failed. When we study the devil's temptation against Jesus, we find that they correspond very close to the failures of Israel. See, Jesus did not complain or grumble, right, when he had lack of food, but satisfied himself with faith in God. Whereas Israel tried, tested the Lord God, Jesus, the true Israel of faith, replied to Satan, it is written, you shall not put the Lord to the test. Whereas Israel rebelled, Christ refused to turn his heart away from God. In fact, he even corrected the devil. He says, you shall, not, you shall worship the Lord your God, and only you shall you serve him. See, in the wilderness of his temptation and testing, Jesus walked in Israel's steps, in our steps, succeeding where they and we have failed. So what does that mean? Jesus has walked ahead of us to clear the pathway. He is that Trail blazer, right? The, he, bla blade the, he, bla bla he blazed the trail of victory through perfect obedience for our salvation. Though we fail, hear this, though we fail, he did not. Though he, we fail, he did not. Through, though we fail, he did not. Why is that important, right? Through faith in Christ who perseveres for us, our failures are hidden in his victory. Our faithlessness is closed in his obedience. His righteousness is presented on our behalf, and now his power is made available to us by his spirit. It is Christ who lives in us now, and it will make, help us walk through that journey, walk through that wilderness as we trust him more and more, relying on his strength he gives us. As we follow him, right, as we rely on his provision, as we look to him in faith, we will surely find goodness and mercy all the days, and we will one day dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of Jesus persevering for us. This is what this table reminds us of. It's a dramatic presentation, right? We see firsthand that Christ gave his life for us. He shed his blood for us, so he is that true Passover lamb. 
that we are looking forward to, celebrating one day in the new heavens and the new earth. But today we come and gather and we consider Jesus and all that he has done for us. So follow along as we prepare our hearts here in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and merciful God, our Father, you have made us, your, made us in your image and for yourself. You have made his, this good world for us to tend and to enjoy. God of our Father, you sought your ancient people when they strayed from you. You freed them from the oppressor and brought them home. God our Father, you have sent your Son to bring us home to you by his incarnation. By his death, by his resurrection, God our Father, O holy and merciful God our Father, send down your Holy Spirit on our bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and on your people, that they may be the body of Christ, reconciled to you and to each other by his blood, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, one in mission to all the world. Until Christ shall come in final victory, we feast together at this heavenly banquet, we cry, Maranatha, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, he ate with his disciples that he loved, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On that same night, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant for, for the forgiveness of many. Do this in remembrance of me, right? It's pointing us to that one day when Christ comes again and we will celebrate that feast all together with him. But now we are able to, to, to experience his grace and mercy as we take of these elements. And so we ask anyone who has put their faith in Christ, one who is, um, yes, maybe wrestling with who Jesus is, we ask you, maybe if you not yet come to faith, not to take of this table, but to consider what has been said today. But for those who have, been, who have put their faith in Christ, this table is for you. This is a family meal. So partake of the bread, partake of the wine. We'll do that together after you come forward. So elders and deacons, for those who are serving, if you could come forward. And so let me pray. And Father, as they come forward, Lord, we ask that you would continue to minister to our hearts. Holy Spirit, Renew us, strengthen us, empower us. Father, help us in this time even to evaluate our hearts, Lord. Help us to know if there's any wicked way in us, any way, areas that we need to change. We know we're still in process. We're still on this journey that you bring testing in our life. Father, so in those testing, Lord, help us to know that you are with us in that journey, that you are in the muck with us, wanting to work in us, wanting to make us more and more like yourself. May you use this time of communion to sanctify us, to draw us close to you even more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So come, come experience the grace and mercy of Christ as you partake of his body and of his blood.
Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. Jesus said, this is my blood shed for you. Because his blood was shed for you, our sins are made clean. We are white as snow. He's made us beautiful in his sight. Let us drink together. Gracious God, thank you for this meal that reminds us that Jesus, you are truly above all things. Jesus, you are supreme over all things. That is that message of the gospel that we first believed when we came to know you is the same gospel that we hold on to day in and day out. Thank you, Lord, that it's so glorious, it's so beautiful, it's so impactful, it's so meaningful. There's, there's so much in that gospel that continues to remind us of your devotion to your people, of your grace to your people. Oh, Lord, thank you for your spirit that works in us to appreciate and enjoy this great gospel that we've been given day in and day out, even as we go through testing, that we know that you are what holds us together, the truth of who you are, Jesus, and all that you've done. Thank you that that does not change. So, Lord, may we go forth in confidence, knowing of the truth of the gospel. May we, may we believe it more and more each and every day so that that will then impact how then we live to those in our lives. So, Lord, do that work, we pray, through Christ. Amen. Let us stand and close in singing, Just As I Am. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be reconciled. I come empty to be filled.
we come, we come when we first believed to receive that forgiveness of pardon. We come even after years in that journey, in that wilderness, we come knowing that it's through your mercy and grace that you delight to heal the wounded, to rescue the desperate, to pardon sinners like us. It's your great delight to win us, to mature us, to grow us, to prepare us for that place in glory one day that we will experience. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you that you invite us to come to you and you do your work of grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the grace. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.